appreciation and thanks to Urbasi Sinha for, uh, for her, in particular, for her energy in bringing this event and symposium to the Raman Research Institute. Uh, and also to all the local and scientific organizing committees that have put together the, the program for today and tomorrow. And also to my colleagues in the administration and services of the Institute for having made this event happen. Uh, I would like to extend a most uh, special welcome, of course, to Professor Anthony Leggett for having expected, for having accepted the invitation to come to RRI and be the focus for the symposium, which is, of course, in a range of topics that is close to your own research interests. Uh, during the days of the founder, Sir C. V. Raman, uh, this institute did his research. So subsequently, the research, uh, the institute formed research groups uh, in the science of liquid crystals and also in radio astronomy. Uh, astronomy, of course, inspired astrophysics and uh, theoretical physics. Uh, theorists naturally desired to see experimental demonstrations of uh, quantum physics in interactions of cold atoms and light, uh, causing the movement of this institute into atom optics and then quantum communications. Uh, for the last several decades, this institute has uh, excelled in uh, building and using radio telescopes, uh, exploring space from long wavelength radio signals to X-rays, and that has built up excellent relationships with the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, whose headquarters is just a few kilometers north of here. In fact, in July this year, we expect that an X-ray polarimeter that is being built in the adjacent building uh, will go to space as a payload on the ExpoSat mission, and this launch is um, fixed for July this year. Uh, this will be the first ever dedicated X-ray polarization satellite that the world has ever launched. Uh, this history makes it natural for RRI to now play a part in taking quantum technologies to space uh, for improved science experiments and for improved communications. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, Urbasi will be showing you all the steps being taken in her lab, uh, working with ISRO uh, for missions that will perform improved space experiments and will also be implementing space-based quantum communications. So I wish you all pleasant days at our institute. I hope you will have the time to flavor the research and atmosphere in this institute apart from the symposium and the food. Welcome. So thanks very much, Ravi, for this very kind introduction and, uh, of course, for recognizing the energy. Uh, that is, of course, what makes us, you know, go ahead and organize such events. Um, on that note, of course, it's our pleasure uh, to organize this symposium in honor of the, one of the most eminent physicists of our time, uh, Professor Anthony James Leggett who of course needs no introduction to this audience. I would like to thank Tony for taking time out of his extremely busy schedule and agreeing to come and enable this event, even though it had to begin on a Sunday, uh, in between his trips to Japan and Italy. So thank you very much. Um, let me just say a few words on how we came to uh, conceive of organizing this event at Raman Research Institute. Um, I have known Tony for almost 12 years now, since my postdoctoral days uh, at the Institute for Quantum Computing Canada, where he has been an associate over the last decade. I have had the good fortune of discussing a lot of my work with him, uh, most notably on our work on testing Bond's rule in quantum mechanics using triple slit experiments during my postdoctoral days. Even after my joining RRI, we have had insightful discussions on our work regarding boundary condition induced correction terms in the superposition principle. When we went on to do the first experiment to test this in the macroscopic domain, he in fact gave us the idea, I don't know whether you remember Tony, of using baffles or blockers for tunability. You came up with this word baffle also and it was baffling at the time but we went on to use it in the manuscript as well. 
an idea that played a key role in the success of this uh, experiment. In fact, I must gratefully mention that Tony has always been very, very supportive of our lab at RRI since its establishment. A very topical experiment that we are working on right now is a loophole-free version of the legged garg inequality using single photons. And I would love to show him the experiment in progress in the lab, uh, time permitting. On a personal note, uh, I would like to add that I've always found Tony to be one of the most humble, polite, and down-to-earth human beings that I've ever met. So, you know, he, this is Sir Anthony Leggett and, you know, without any airs whatsoever. He's the one who would cycle from the apartment to IQC every day, uh, even when conditions were not favorable and with no demands of any kind. So then, you know, he has even treated my husband, Nonindo, and me to homemade Malaysian chicken curry while at IQC, prepared with utmost care and finesse, involving two days of preparation. So that is kind of what sums him up. Extreme dedication in everything and no, you know, always humble. So it's, it's such a pleasure to learn and hopefully, you know, uh, uh, you know, we learn from you this aspect as well. Coming back to the event, the idea for the symposium came up uh, during my discussions with my collaborator, Professor Deepankar Holm, of the Bose Institute in Calcutta. He is the co-convener for this event. Uh, we became aware of Tony's 80th birthday uh, through the invitation we both received at the event held at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, a uh, few months ago. Considering Tony's close association with India over the last few decades, including many visits and interactions with a number of Indian physicists, we thought it befitting to organize this symposium. In planning this, we have largely relied on Tony's suggestions regarding the specifics of the symposium. We are grateful, of course, to the RRI director and administration for allowing and supporting us very much in this endeavor. We even got the permission on time for the visas and so on, which never happens before an event at RRI. So then, I mean, you know, so that was the way administration really quickly picked up on things and worked very hard. We hope that the next two days uh, turn out to be scientifically stimulating as well as enjoyable for all of us. And with this, uh, I would like to hand over the podium to my co-convener, Professor Deepankar Holm from Bose Institute in Calcutta, and invite him to say a few words. So thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this symposium. Thanks very much, Professor Sub Ravi, for uh, kindly agreeing to uh, inaugurate this symposium. It has been a matter of great uh, satisfaction for me personally to be associated with the organization of this symposium. And of course, Urboshi has been bearing the brunt of going through the nitty gritty of organizing it. And we are, of course, grateful to Tony for agreeing to our, to our request which was rather at a short notice and we had to do things fairly, fairly quickly to accommodate the dates and amidst his busy schedule. Now, Tony's seminal contributions in the fields of low temperature physics and dissipative quantum systems are very well known. And we have Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan with us and he will say a few words after me about those aspects of his contributions briefly. I, uh, Tony has been also deeply involved and has also contributed quite significantly to the studies concerning what we call foundations of quantum mechanics and what he calls interestingly experimentally oriented studies on conceptual aspects of quantum mechanics. In fact, that has been the leitmotif of his works. So within five short minutes, I'll just give you a quick overview of his involvement in the studies of foundations of quantum mechanics because I'm sure many of this audience may not be aware of it. In order to put things in historical perspectives, uh, you know very well everybody knows about Bell's theorem and in the post-Bell's theorem period when there was a resurgence of interest concerning fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics, from mid-70s the experimental efforts were initiated towards exploring, studying Bell's theorem, which picked up in the early years of 80s. And it is interesting that Tony, uh, during his post, 
doctoral years, means late 60s, started getting deeply interested in the foundational, as he himself uh, told us. And then what he called, he was seduced by the foundational problems of quantum mechanics, and in particular the quantum measurement problem. And then in 1980, he wrote a very significant, and it has turned out to be quite seminal paper, and we, where he, pro he started his explorations proposing how quantum mechanics should be tested at the macroscopic level. So that was entirely a new direction of study at that time, independent of studies based on Bell's theorem. That he, that he pointed out that it is important to test quantum superpositions at the, at the level which is closer to our everyday life and involving superpositions of many particles one at, at a time, means involving superpositions of millions of, say, electrons going in one way or the other. The importance of testing this that he highlighted in this 80 paper and in the years following, culminating in, in what is now regarded as a famous paper in 1985, proposing Leggett-Gark inequality. And it is interesting, just a year after that paper, uh, I was, and I had, I had then finished, had also in, during my postdoctoral years at that time became interested in these foundational questions. And in 1986, there was a very important and a very fruitful conference, International Symposium, that Hitachi started International Symposium on Foundations of Quantum Mechanics in light of new technology. So that was well ahead of time. Now, last 10 years or 15 years, but at that time itself, after the initial experimental efforts, Hitachi, and in that first symposium, I remember I met Tony and he gave his talk based on Leggett Gark inequality. That was perhaps one of the earliest conferences we talked about it. And there was animated debate and discussions after his talk with many eminent physicists like C.N. Young, many others were there. And, and Tony has to face, had to face a lot of skepticism and criticisms and the way he was answering them, tackling them. So that, and afterwards I had a lot of discussions with him at that conference and then began my close interactions with him and then I had the good fortune of working on topics like legged gark inequality and also the quantum measurement problem he has been then starting advocating why they propose solutions are, advocate, are inadequate, why quantum measurement problem is important in a number of conferences where I also happened to be there. And then we started having his visits to Calcutta where we organized a number of events at closely associated to in, with his lectures on these foundational aspects of quantum mechanics. And that had played a key role in inspiring a group of young researchers in Calcutta, getting them inspired, working on these foundational aspects. Well, ahead of time, because then in 90s, foundational studies got linked with quantum information, and then the studies had become respectable or part of the mainstream, and more and more experiments were done. So it is interesting that 1985-80, the ideas Leggett, he proposed Tony, were started being experimentally implemented almost 25 years or 30 years later. And now more experiments are being done and Tony is now very active and just, just a couple of years back, probably it was a year back, the, the latest experiment using flux qubit, which is one of the most decisive experiments testing the ideas Tony proposed were done and he's a co-author of them. And then he also, it is interesting, those late 70s, he worked on ideas what he, he called crypto non-locality, which was much ahead of time. During the time he spent at Ghana during his teaching assignment. That was just late 70s before the Allen aspects experiments even on Bell's theorem. And later again, 20, 25 years later, that ideas were published and also experiments have been done and I had the good fortune on working on those things and closely exchanging ideas with him and he has been contributing and significantly to the many of my works and so particularly those the ideas we had been working about extending his ideas about quantum testing at the macro level for the ideas of quantum indistinguishability and further studies using systems other than flux qubits. So Tony's contributions to the foundations have been, 
have been quite, it would be an understatement, have been of a pioneering kind because these directions of studies that he has initiated. And, uh, and we are grateful to Tony for his support and contributions and I personally. And also, I may just gratefully mention, I learned a lot of things from him and my book, he was kind enough to give detailed comments to each chapter of my book and then wrote the foreword. So I learned a lot about those. And we have been continuing interacting now on fresh new ideas because now this subject has become so important and so more intimately linked with experiments. But in 86, when I first met Tony, I still remember the kind of skepticism he faced. So I am always struck by his, the way he continued to defend his views, develop them and maintain them, reflecting a kind of what others may call a degree of iconoclasm the way he pursued it with utmost passion, that has been very inspiring to many of us. So thank you, Tony, and I'm very fortunate to be associated with the organization of this symposium. Thanks, Urbushi, for your effort. So thanks, everybody, and I, now I welcome Professor T. V. Ramakrishnan to say a few words. Well, uh, thank you uh, all. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers, that is Urvashi Sinha and uh, uh, Professor Deepankar Home, for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, talk about a, a person who has uh, inspired so many of our, us uh, working in this field. Um, I first said, I was told that I should talk, in, uh, talk about this in three or four minutes. Then I said, well, I can't do it. Uh, maybe I'll take 10 minutes, but I don't know how many minutes I will take. But I'll say just a very few things because, uh, you know, for someone who has uh, for um, five or six decades uh, not only been a pioneer, but uh, been a, a foundational figure in the field, uh, it is difficult to uh, compress his contributions to five minutes. But on the other hand, I know that the Ramayana has been compressed into one shloka. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, now, um, first thing I want to say is that among the great figures in um, uh, contemporary condensed matter physics, uh, Professor Leggett is one of those uh, who has uh, been uh, the closest to the foundational aspects of uh, physics. And he has said many times that uh, condensed matter physics can be considered as a test bed of fundamental quantum mechanics. Hmm. Now, it is not that uh, uh, he looks upon condensed matter, at least that's what I feel, it's not that he looks upon condensed matter as only a tool in uh, uh, demonstrating this or possibly demonstrating this, though he has proposed and uh, with great doggedness and perseverance uh, shown a number of possibilities which can uh, be there for such a thing. I remember uh, long ago in uh, Lesouche, he gave a whole series of lectures on uh, how to uh, test uh, quantum mechanics uh, through phenomena involving macroscopic quantum coherence. Uh, you know, this has been, I think, one of the running themes in his uh, um, work, which is to how small effects, very small effects, can be amplified by quantum coherence. Uh, uh, but I cannot go on about this. Um, I do want to say that uh, to put it in perspective, it is uh, necessary for us to uh, fall back a little and look at things. Uh, you see, uh, the, the fact that uh, matter is quantum mechanical began to hit us in 1925. Mo uh, many, most physicists at that time were very uncomfortable with it. Uh, but uh, starting in the generation just after the Second World War, uh, there were, and, and at that time, uh, solid state physics was, um, uh, I think, I don't know that deservedly or not, it was known as the squalid state physics. Uh, and uh, this is the name given by uh, actually one of the founders of solid state physics, that is uh, Wolfgang Pauli. Mm. Uh, now, be that as it may, uh, in the, this, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, there are many anecdotal um, evidences for this. Uh, Walter Cohn, one of the, um, uh, I would say, pivotal figures uh, after the Second World War, said that uh, when he went to um, uh, Copenhagen as a postdoctoral fellow and met uh, Niels Bohr for the first time, the great man had not heard of such a subject. 
So, uh, well, from that, uh, the condensed matter physics has risen a great deal. And uh, for the rise of condensed matter physics, uh, at least in the first part of it, uh, a number of uh, great figures were responsible. Uh, they gave it the kind of intellectual depth uh, which enabled us to appreciate the richness in phenomena which this field exhibits, uh, in Landau, Cohn, Anderson, and so on. Uh, in the second generation, and the generation after that, uh, I think Leggett is one of the handful of pioneers who have enabled, enriched, and expanded this field uh, in depth and breadth, and have, uh, among those people, he is one of those, I will uh, repeat again, uh, who has uh, uh, been most uh, particular about the connection of this field to fundamentals of physics. Uh, there are a number of uh, specific things I can talk about. Uh, of course, the uh, activity which uh, resulted in a Nobel Prize for him was his identification of superfluidity in helium-3. Uh, now, uh, in the 70s, uh, okay, it was in the air that there is superfluidity in helium-3. Eh? Uh, but uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the, and there were anomalous observations, uh, but uh, he was the first person to make sense of those anomalous observations and to show that uh, two specific phases, superfluid helium A and B, were the result of the, uh, were the consequences of these anomalous observations and to uh, propose the notion of uh, spontaneously broken spin orbit symmetry, hmm, uh, which enabled a very small effect uh, the the uh, dipole, uh, dipole interaction between uh, helium-3 uh, nucleus and the electron to uh, sh uh, show observable signals in the nuclear magnetic resonance of this uh, system. Uh, well, uh, he has, uh, uh, in superconducting superfluidity itself, I can talk about many, many things which he has uh, uh, been, uh, he has pioneered. Uh, for example, the idea of the uh, crossover between the bardeen cooper schieffer limit and the Bose-Einstein condensation limit. Huh? Um, uh, and uh, the idea that uh, the uh, symmetry of the order parameter in cuprate superconductors has uh, a dx square minus y square form and that uh, this uh, can be experimentally uh, addressed. Uh, most recently in this field, uh, he has uh, uh, drawn attention, repeated attention, to the question of where is the energy saving in superconductivity in cuprate superconductors. I mean, after all, if there are superconductors, they should be objects of lower energy. If they are objects of lower energy, this energy saving must come from somewhere. From where is it coming? Hmm. Uh, then, uh, you see, uh, <laughs> there are many obscure things, relatively obscure things which we don't know about. Uh, but, uh, you know, as a, a person who has uh, spent a lifetime in this field, I know that uh, he has been interested in the question of uh, uh, two-level systems, uh, interacting two-level systems. And uh, there is a very nice article by uh, him called Through a Glass Darkly, hmm, which, is, uh, which I like very much. I also like very much a slim book which he has written called The Problems of Physics, eh, which was published by Oxford University Press. And uh, I very often uh, admiringly quote uh, his uh, classification of the frontiers of physics into four, the large, the small, the complex, and the unclear. Uh, I am very grateful for Professor Leggett's life journey uh, and for his inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, for that wonderful, uh, you know, impromptu discussion on all the work that Tony has done. And I mean, I guess you you needed a bit more time. Yeah. I got more time than I <laughs> you sure? Okay. <laughs> so then uh, I think we would uh, call this inaugural. I mean, we will uh, end this inaugural session. But just a few practical uh, things that I wanted to announce. One is that we have a Wi-Fi. Uh, arranged for the members, uh, for the delegates of the symposium, and that is the password, so please do use that if you feel the need. And then, of course, uh, registration has been happening in the council room outside, and some of you may not have registered, so please kindly uh, do that. And then, of course, um, 
the schedule uh, has been put up on both walls. There's only one change from the one that you have with you, uh, which is that uh, Professor Taraftar is speaking tomorrow and Professor Quek is speaking today, today. So they have been swapped because Professor Quek has to leave tomorrow morning. And so that is the only uh, um, marked change uh, in what you have. And um, yeah, I think uh, on that note, uh, we will end this session. And Ashutosh, will you be bringing a cake in now? Okay, so we are ending this session, but then we are going to go on to celebrating what we wanted to celebrate, which is a birthday. And so we are going to request Tony to cut a cake. So there was a debate on the color of the book. Somebody <laughs> said mustard, somebody wanted light blue. And then we went with light blue. <laughs> Somehow felt that that would gel more with you. Yes. Light blue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Happy birthday to Tony Leggett. <clears throat> he will be the first speaker in this session. Um, it's difficult for me to be excessively informal. It's a reflection of age, I suppose. So may I in invite Sir Anthony James Leggett to speak to us <laughs> a 60-year career in physics, recollections and reflections. Sir Leggett. Birthday, but also you know, roughly the 60th year of my work uh, in physics. And I first of all um, like to thank Obushi and uh, Dipankar very much for organising this meeting. I realise that even a relatively small meeting like this is an enormous trouble to uh, organise, and I'm really very, very grateful to them for making the effort. I'd also like to thank the uh, Raman Research Institute and its staff for um, en enabling it to be held, uh, held here. And um, finally, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Bhushit Dipankar and uh, TV Ramakrishnan for their kind uh, remarks before the, the break. Um, I, in this uh, talk, I, which is going to be very informal, I will uh, just try to review some of the highlights, what I would regard as the highlights of my uh, career, and perhaps put a little, um, a little emphasis on, uh, on things you may not um, uh, perhaps be uh, very, very much very familiar with, and also try to see what lessons, if any, I've been able to draw um, from some of these episodes. So um, I started off um, in um, the, on the arts side, um, both at high school and university. And one um, person, I think, who really made a huge contribution um, to my career, at least indirectly, was an old retired priest at my school who, um, I won't go into the sort of details of how, how this happened, but he gave me basically a crash course in some interesting elements of modern mathematics. And um, that was really absolutely invaluable later, later in, to me in my later uh, career. But uh, I did go on to, uh, to study um, the so-called Greats course in Oxford. That's um, Latin and Greek languages, Greek and Roman history, and philosophy. And it's a four-year course. Um, and I um, uh, really enjoyed that hugely. And I would have to say, although in some sense, uh, had I simply majored in physics and gone on into physics, I probably would have published more papers and earlier papers and so forth, never for a moment have I regretted that four years that I, I spent on the Greats course. I think it was a wonderful education in parallel with what I was able to receive later in physics. Um, of course, uh, as you know, eventually I did um, switch to physics. Um, when, I, uh, so when I tell this story to my colleagues in uh, North America um, these days, they sometimes look at me wistfully and say, yes, it must have been so much easier to switch from the arts to the science side in Britain in the 60s than it would be in the USA today. Not a bit of it, I can assure you. It was much, much more difficult. And I um, had to uh, have a lot of help from a lot of people to whom I will be always grateful. Um, uh, one of them, interestingly, is probably someone you might not know. Does anyone know who General Sergei Korolev was? No, I thought it was. Um, General Sergei Korolev, he had to actually go incognito for most of his, his life because of fear of assassination by the CIA. Um, but he was actually the leader of the Russian um, former Soviet Union team which put up the first Sputnik in 1957, October 1957. And as I've related in more detail in my, for example, in my um, autobiographical note for the Nobel Foundation, that was a really essential element in enabling me to, get, to go on to a career in physics. So i will always be grateful to Dr. To General Korolev, although he doesn't know who I am, I'm sure. Um, uh, the other two people who helped me very greatly are um, two Oxford physicists, um, 
uh, David Brink, um, who was the um, person who really was the sort of gatekeeper for my career in physics, he had to take the crucial decision on whether it really made sense for me, you know, having no, essentially no um, physics background um, and a very, very minimal maths background. It made sense for me, nevertheless, to transfer to a second undergraduate degree in physics. And he made that decision in my favour, and again, I'm always grateful to him. Um, the other person was my... Uh, David, as far as I know, incidentally, is still, still alive, though he seems to be rather out of contact. Um, the other um, uh, person who was very important was Michael Baker, who was my undergraduate um, tutor at Merton in Oxford. Um, he um, unfortunately died about a year or so ago, but um, uh, uh, he, again, accepted me and persuaded the Oxford College to accept me. Uh, again, a crucial point in my career. So um, I did eventually manage to switch from the art side to physics. Um, I think um, intellectually it was quite a big shock because on the art side of the university, and at least in particular in the degree I was doing in, um, say, the philosophy part, uh, it would be quite normal that my tutor would assign me to go away and read the most recent um, articles in the, uh, in the technical philosophical journals and then we would come back and um, discuss together, and at least ostensibly, on, a, on an equal footing. In other words, I could really feel that I was right up to the frontier, um, even though I was still an undergraduate in philosophy. And of course, that changed enormously when I had to make the switch into physics. Um, you always feel you have at least um, several years to go before you get anywhere near the frontier. And that was, of course, the, uh, the case with me, too. But um, I did eventually uh, successfully complete an undergraduate degree. And then, of course, I had to try to, uh, um, uh, to go on to, um, uh, to a postgraduate, a PhD or a DPhil degree. Um, well, the only, with my very unusual history, the only place which was likely to take me was Oxford. Um, in those days, um, sort of, uh, because of the detailed history of the various areas of physics, um, the only place, uh, is that we're talking now about 1951, uh, um, the only place which was um, uh, I take was Oxford, and the only, only area of physics which seemed to be really rather active and interesting in those days was condensed matter. Um, uh, I'd never been uh, particularly good as an experimentalist. I had done the standard experimental labs, but uh, it wasn't my cup of tea. So I decided to try to do condensed matter theory. So who, um, who would be my advisor? Well, the, um, there was one person in Oxford in those days in theoretical condensed matter who was willing to take a lot of people on, on charts. So that was, my, that was um, the late Dirk Taha at Morton. So I applied to Dirk, and he accepted me. Um, what I hadn't entirely realised um, when I applied to him was that his um, style of supervision, I would say, was, well, shall we say, somewhat unusual, even for Oxford in 1961. Um, basically, he regarded um, his um, duties as a supervisor to consist of three things. He would get, find you money for your studies, which he did extremely efficiently, also in my case. He would um, make sure you filled in all the university forms on time. Again, uh, he did without any, any kind of problem. And in the event that you succeeded in getting your doctorate, then he would uh, find you a postdoc position. He, uh, he did all these three things. Beyond that, you're on your own, quite literally. Uh, not only would he not, um, it, uh, not help you to solve your thesis problem, he wouldn't even help you to find your thesis problem. Um, I uh, sometimes semi-seriously think that were Dick Tahara alive today, and were he to try operating in this way in a modern North American research university, he would probably be the target of a lawsuit. <laughs> but, uh, but it worked. He, um, uh, he, as I say, he'd accept um, uh, a lot of people on, on, uh, uh, in uh, the hope that it would work out. Sometimes it didn't. And he, so he, I think he had a failure rate of about 50%. 50% of his PhD students did not graduate, but 
I don't think that wasn't so bad because um, I think most of them went off and did something else and were much happier than they would have been going on for a career in, in academic physics. And so I think it, in some ways it was not a bad system and I try to at least adopt some elements of it nowadays with my own um, students. I don't go to the quite extreme level that do it. Um, well, I ended up eventually... Oh, yes, I should say one thing that Dirk did do, apart from his uh, three duties he'd taken on himself, was to um, encourage me to learn enough Russian to, um, uh, to read the Lush Russian literature. And in fact, I made some money as a graduate student by translating um, some of the current uh, Soviet uh, journals and so forth. And that was very useful to me in subsequent life. Um, um, one of the, uh, uh, an another aspect of my graduate studies, which I'd just like to mention at least, was that from the, um, from the very first, I think it's probably true to say from the first week of my graduate studies, I was doing the maximum amount of undergraduate teaching that was allowed by Oxford in those days, which was six hours a week. Um, and again, um, that's something I've absolutely never regretted. I think it was very, very useful um, uh, training, and I strongly encourage nowadays my own students to, uh, uh, to, to get as much teaching as they, uh, they can. Um, my, um, uh, my PhD thesis um, was not, um, not particularly no noteworthy. I had, um, uh, I'd become rather fascinated by Landau Fermi liquid theory. Remember we're, uh, we're talking about, so, let's say, 1962, 1963, and the Landau Fermi liquid theory had only come out in 56, and because of um, the sort of political barriers and so forth, it was not really very well known in, um, in the West at that time. But I, I became rather, rather um, fascinated with it. Um, and uh, so, in fact, half of my thesis was on dilute uh, solutions of helium-4 in helium-3. Um, of course, uh, since I was working at absolute zero, and we now know that helium-4 is not stable in helium-3 at absolute zero, um, that was, uh, really fell rather flat <laughs> eventually, but, uh, but it got, got me into the helium-3 business in some ways. Um, as well, having, um, uh, having completed eventually my, my PhD over oh, DPhil with Dick Taha, I went on to uh, the University of... Um, I applied for a postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and somewhat to my surprise got it. David Pines was willing to take me on as a, um, uh, a, a postdoc. And so I worked there um, for the year uh, 1964 to 5 at the uh, University of Illinois. Um, it was a great, uh, great place. Um, yeah, still, I, I'd like to think it still is, but it certainly was in those days. Um, that we had John Bardeen, uh, David Pines, uh, Leo Kadanoff, Gordon Baim, and then a whole lot of other people in slightly different fields, like Hans Frauenfelder, who was still enormously um, uh, intellectually pr provocative. So I, I found it a great place to, uh, to work. Um, it was during, during that year that I worked on um, uh, trying to combine the BCS um, theory of superconductivity with the Landau theory of a Fermi liquid. Um, as far as I was aware, that had, had not been done, at least not been done at finite temperatures, um, and I was able to, um, uh, to make what I thought was a nice little, um, little discovery, uh, that um, the Landau Fermi liquid effects were going to change the dependence of certain quantities non-trivially away from the simple BCS predictions. I was pretty excited about this, and it, um, got it uh, paper published, I got, uh, got it mentioned in talks and so forth, and as I, um, as I remarked in my um, popular outreach talk uh, uh, yesterday evening, uh, luckily I didn't, did not know that I had in fact been anticipated on this. Had I known, I think it would have been a major damper. And, uh, so in some, uh, in some ways I think it's good not to know certain things. And, uh, uh, so, so, but anyway, it gave me a lot of encouragement. My um, second postdoc year was spent um, in Kyoto, Japan, with, um, in the group of Professor Takeo Matsubara. Um, that was a hugely important experience to me in personal terms, or in personal and cultural um, terms. But also, um, during that um, year, I um, did do a little calculation on two-band superconductors, which, again, uh, at the time seemed to fall flat, but later came, came, in, came in to be quite, quite useful. 
to me. Um, and the uh, one of the things I uh, one of the, the uh, things I did during my stay in Kyoto in that year 1965 to six was to, uh, on the basis of experience in the progress of theoretical physics editorial office where I vetted manuscripts coming in from Japanese authors to check the English and so forth. I wrote a little little um, note on the writing of scientific English for Japanese physicists. And um, that eventually got published in the Nihon Butsuri Gakaishi, the um, Journal of the Physical Society of Japan. Um, and I actually think semi-seriously that, um, uh, that all the publications I've written over the last 60 years, in terms of real impact, that is really changing the way other people do or don't do things, that was probably the most important paper I've written, in fact. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, eventually uh, I had one more roving postdoc uh, year and um, then I uh, applied for and got a job at the University of Sussex in fall of 67. And um, one of the reasons I'd chosen to apply to the University of Sussex um, was that um, it had a reputation for a very relaxed and uh, um, generous um, intellectual atmosphere. Um, you are not continually pressed to publish, publish papers. Um, you're not even, um, you, you were expected to uh, do a good, good job teaching, and I tried to do that. Um, but you were allowed to explore your uh, interests, even though they might not lead to rapid publications and so on and so forth. And um, I found this very congenial. Um, and one of the things I did um, soon after I uh, went to, uh, arrived at Sussex was to attend a, set, a series of lectures by my colleague Brian Eastley. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago, but um, he was an a, um, unusual person. He'd actually uh, done his uh, thesis and postdoctoral work in in um, uh, in Copenhagen in um, uh, nuclear low energy nuclear physics, um, but then uh, become very interested in the history and sociology of science and more is converted to that. But um, uh, he actually gave a, a sort of mini lecture series um, on the foundations of quantum mechanics, and up to that point, I had basically um, taken the position which uh, around that time. Uh, was described by the late John Bell, something like this. Um, the average physicist feels that um, all the problems in the foundations of quantum mechanics have long been solved, and that he will easily be able to understand the solution if he can only spend, find tw uh, 20 minutes to spare to look at it. And I had basically, I think, uh, taken that view, but um, Brian's lectures did actually um, shake that, shake my confidence in fact. And I started getting rather interested in the um, foundations of physics and started uh, reading material on it, but uh, didn't publish for uh, um, that particular time. One of the things I did do, actually, which um, I'm sure very few of you any know about, was that um, I wrote a little essay. This was actually um, it was published in a... Um, a, a, a journal called Second Order, which was published in, in Ife in Nigeria. I, I, I wrote the essay because I'd been asked to by the editor, who was a, a friend. But um, uh, he was basically exploring the nature of research in condensed matter physics. And I would like to think, in, in retrospect, that it made some of the same points as Phil Anderson did, did around the same time in his famous uh, More is Different. Kind of, 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 um, but as I say, the, the journal was obscure and I don't think many, too many people knew about that. Um, I, uh, I uh, spent 15 years at um, Sussex, um, pretty pleasant years I have to say. Um, there were quite, quite a few frictions at the time between faculty and faculty, stu fa students and faculty, <laughs> students and students, and I don't know if any of you know a little novel which was written by, ah, boy, names, names, um, as a British novelist, Ian, um, come back to me. Anyway, uh, he's rather, rather well-known um, British novelist, but he has a little um, novel called um, The Sweet Tooth, 
um, which was um, is, uh, which is actually set in the University of Sussex in the years that I was there, and it gives a rather, I have to say, a rather jaundiced point of view about the, the, the uh, ethos of the place, but I found it actually pretty congenial. Uh, during that time, I, I, um, uh, I, I was able to make various foreign trips. Um, in, uh, in particular, I went to a couple of Polish summer schools that involved, we're talking now about um, the uh, late 60s, early 70s, so the Cold War is still in, in full swing. The Iron Curtain is down across uh, Europe, and, and going to a Polish summer school did involve crossing the Iron Curtain and so forth. So it was a bit of a sort of mini adventure, I'd say. But equally, uh, other, uh, apart from that, I also spent a couple of um, semesters in Ghana, in West Africa. Um, again, um, a very interesting experience from the cultural point of view. Um, and in addition, again, I uh, had a lot of spare time. The library was a mess, so there are no, um, uh, it's impossible to really refer to past journals. So I decided that I needed to do some research on um, uh, something which, uh, on which there's no, no literature. So, um, so I wrote what was effectively my first paper in the Foundations area. De Banco referred to it. This is on the um, on so-called non-local hidden variable theories, but that was to remain published, unpublished for a quarter of a century after that, in fact. Um, yeah, so um, eventually in the, um, in the spring of uh, 82, I got the offer of the position of the chair I now hold at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and um, I decided to accepted and moved there in the fall of 1983, and I've now been there for more than, uh, what is it, 83 to uh, 30, more than 35 years, yes. At, so most of my career, in fact, has been spent at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Again, a very congenial um, place to work, although the sort of attitudes towards um, research and publishing and so forth are perhaps a bit different from uh, Sussex. Um, while I was uh, there, um, I started, uh, well, in fact, it had been my last couple of years at Sussex that I started get going back to the foundations of quantum mechanics and started to see, and um, I have to say there were a um, couple of my colleagues there who, in some sense, were, in, were involved in the superconducting device area and were um, proclaiming that basically these um, superconducting devices, like what we now call a flux qubit, that these were basically just um, uh, just huge atoms, and you should be able to do everything with them that you could do with atoms. Well, um, I thought that was really a bit um, a bit naive because they really didn't um, didn't take into account all the work that theorists have done on decoherence and so forth. And um, uh, so it seemed to me, at least at first sight, that it's are going to be either impossible or very difficult to um, attain the kind of conditions which they implicitly assumed. So, um, um, so I, but I, anyway, I started um, thinking about this, and in my last couple of years of Sussex, my student, um, Amir Caldera, um, uh, in some sense found the key to, um, to uh, an analysis of the effects of dissipation and decoherence on quantum tunneling out of a metastable world. So we. Uh, we uh, published a Physical of Leisure and later a longer, uh, longer paper on that uh, topic. Um, uh, uh, so, so that was one, one of my uh, main activities during the early 80s, but also just happened that uh, I guess soon after I um, went to Sussex, uh, sorry, went to Illinois, um, a paper appeared um, uh, in, in Physical Review Letters claiming that Bell's theorem is complete nonsense and uh, you could recover everything lo using local hidden variables. Um, I was so annoyed by this paper <laughs> that I uh, wrote a somewhat stinging, I would have to say somewhat stinging um, comment on it. Um, about a half a dozen other people did too, I should say, at the time. But um, evidently my comment so impressed the editor of Physical Review Letters that he then called upon me to join the editorial board. Um, uh, uh, he thought it was a danger in uh, doing things too emphatically. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, for about probably a dozen years or so, from the late 80s to the late 90s, um, I was an associate editor in the, uh, in the area of foundations of quantum mechanics, which had not previously, I mean, previously they had not had a, a special editor, so I was the first one for this. 
Um, and uh, during that time, there was something which I still remember, which uh, intrigued me quite a bit. We thought I, uh, I, would, I, I would, the editor would normally send me um, the papers in the foundation's area when they came in, and I would just go do a sort of first spot check to say if they were quite pot, which in fact quite a few of them were, um, or whether they could be safely passed on to referees and so forth. Um, so I got this, I received this paper uh, by a couple of authors whose names I didn't know, working at an establishment, some kind of research establishment in Britain, um, which again I didn't know, by that time I was already in the US. Um, and it seemed okay, it was about, it was about Bell's theorem and related um, matters, it seemed, seemed okay, so I uh, recommended that it be sent to referees, dot, dot, dot. A few weeks later, we got a letter um, from the um, from the authors, which was passed on to me, they were very embarrassed and they said, um, look, we're sorry, we think we may have to withdraw this paper because our managers want to classify it. I thought, what? Bill, sir, you, you know, you want to, to um, take probably the, in some sense the most abstract <laughs> issue in, in the whole of physics. You, you, you uh, have a paper on that and it has to be classified? What? What's going on? <laughs> um, well, luckily, um, uh, luckily the managers uh, did relent and uh, allow it to be um, published. And, it, and, and of course, it, what I was actually witnessing in some sense was the birth of the quantum information revolution. The, the idea that, um, that, that the most subtle aspects of quantum mechanics could actually be um, applied for practical use. I, in retrospect, I rather regret I didn't uh, take more notice of that at the time and to take it more seriously because, in fact, I, I have to say I sort of missed out on much of the development of the, uh, in the 90s of the quantum information field. Um, but anyway, that's what um, happened there. Um, apart from the work with um, uh, the work on um, dissipative quantum mechanics and so forth, which occupied a lot of my time in the um, in the uh, 80s, is uh, I actually uh, did get involved with a, a number of what I call quirky problems. These are, uh, what I mean by quirky problems is one which involve considerations which not in some sense in the main line of your, your subject and, and, and require you to go away and read outside the uh, normal area. And um, for example, there was the um, work I did on um, the possible nucleation of the B phase of helium-3 by cosmic rays. Um, that raised a certain amount of scepticism initially. Um, I, I'm told that one of, my, uh, uh, one of my colleagues was heard to remark that I'd really been working too hard in order to take a rest. <laughs> Such a crazy idea, but well, uh, a few years later it, it looks like it was, it was effectively um, borne out. So, but I had to think of a lot of, a lot of things that I, that in my normal course of, uh, of my career as a physicist, I would not have needed to think about. Like, for example, um, most of the um, most of, most of the uh, experimental labs which have done the experiments on the nucleation of the B phase of helium three are actually in the basement. How how many meters of concrete does that mean they have above them? <laughs> so it got me in all sorts of little um, questions like that. There was the work on. Um, possible parity violation by the B phase of helium-3, which I talked about briefly in my talk last night. Um, there's a work I did with my colleague Gordon Boehm on cold fusion um, uh, where, when it was first announced. We thought, um, basically we poured cold water, in effect, we, uh, on the idea of um, cold fusion using hydrogen and palladium. I thought naively, this is the one occasion in my life when I would actually be able to affect the stock market was surely when, when people realise the significance of this paper, the price of palladium uh, will drop. <laughs> uh, not at all. It turns out the price of palladium has nothing to do with cold fusion. It's entirely controlled by the, uh, the Soviet uh, uh, producers and so forth. They actually went up after that. So I had a counter, if anything, I had a counter effect. But the one, I think the one uh, little paper that I really like most from those days is one which I suspect m many of you don't have not heard of, not surprisingly. It was on the, the question, uh, the following question. Suppose that the B phase doesn't indeed nucleate at some site in the, in the metastable A phase. Then it's got to advance to eat up the whole sample. 
So you have this question, how, how fast does the, um, the boundary between the A and B phase actually progress in liquid? And this turned out to be a really, very um, interesting problem. And the person who really, I think, um, uh, did, um, contributed in some sense most to this was my, my then student, Yip Sung Kit, now, now in Taiwan, working in Taiwan. Um, initially, um, we'd, uh, we'd of course tried to work out the forces driving the boundary, we'd try to work out the, um, uh, the, the uh, frictional force on it. What would the frictional force be? Well, it would consist of A phase quasar particles coming up to the boundary and bouncing, being reflected, bouncing back off, off it. And that should, should act as a sort of frictional mechanism. Well, we, um, uh, we did a little calculation and made the prediction that this, the maximum speed of motion of the boundary should be about one millimeter per second. And it turned out that well, just at that time, the Los Alamos group, um, John, John Wheatley and his um, uh, students and after his death, his inheritors, um, they were actually doing experiments on, the, on this particular question at just that time. And so um, we uh, proudly, um, you know, we pr proudly sent them a message announcing our conclusion that the terminal velocity was going to be about one millimeter per second. They wrote back saying, ha ha, well we actually just measured it and it's actually one meter per second. <laughs> so a thousand times what we predicted. Not, not a good, and then, and then we realized what was happening. When these quasar particles of the A phase come up to the, the boundary between the A and B phase and get reflected, it's not normal reflection, it's Andreev reflection. And as you, some of you might know, the um, Andreev reflection only um, ca uh, carries away a, a very tiny fraction of the total momentum. So we recalculated um, using, uh, using that idea, and sure enough, it came out at about one meter per second. So that was really, I think, very satisfying. And I, I find that one of the most satisfying papers I've written, even though it probably has less than 1% of the citation rate of many, some of my other papers. Um, eventually, uh, I uh, got interested in the um, business of high temperature um, uh, superconductivity um, and uh, eventually was, was able to uh, collaborate with my uh, experimental colleague um, uh, uh, Delvin Harlingen uh, to do a test of the symmetry of the order parameter. Again, very, very satisfying because basically that was a yes no question. You could, the answer had to be really either S wave or D wave, and the only question was which it was. And so we were able to make a rather firm prediction that it would be, well, of course, other people had also made that prediction that it would be D wave, but we were able to, to, um, uh, to give some suggestion of how it might be tested. And we were not the only ones, but other people thought of it simultaneously, I guess, but nevertheless, ours was, was the first paper um, actually published on this, so that, that was nice, I enjoyed that. Another thing I, I also enjoyed, um, again, uh, perhaps less, um, didn't make quite such a, a splash, was the, um, uh, some work I did concerning the Anderson interlayer tunneling model. Um, those of you who are in the cuprate uh, business might recall that uh, in, I guess, the late 80s and early 90s, um, there was this um, theory by Phil Anderson that it was um, the saving of of uh, kinetic energy in the C-axis tunneling, which was the mechanism that drove the superconducting transition. I was able to, to contribute a bit to, the, to that uh, to, by, by showing certain consequences of it. Um, and eventually, as you may know, um, Kathy Muller and others, um, Dirk, Dirk van der Marle, um, uh, did the experiments which um, basically refuted the interlayer uh, tunneling model. But I nevertheless think, um, that of all the theories which were um, in, evolved during the uh, 80s and late 80s and um, 90s on cuprate superconductivity, I actually think Anderson's interlayer tunneling model was in some sense the most valuable. The reason it was most valuable was quite simply that it was refutable. It was sufficiently crisply formulated and quantitatively formulated that you actually do an experiment to see if it was right or wrong. That was not true, I'm afraid, of most of the other theories of high temperature uh, superconductivity in those days. So, uh, so I found that quite satisfying also. Um, around, uh, sometime around in the late 90s, I decided to get involved in the ultra cold gas field. And the reason, I had a rather, rather definite reason for doing that. 
I thought, okay, here is a topic where there's no reason to think that nature is going to do anything other than textbooks tell her to, and, and indeed that turned out essentially to be the case. Uh, but at the same time, there are any number of interesting experiments which you would have liked to do, we say, on helium-4, but uh, for all sorts of practical reasons you couldn't, and people were going to be doing these on, on the ultra-cold gases, and I thought, this is going to be a marvellous area for graduate student uh, just to do their PhDs in. So, um, so I did indeed go into that, and I had a sequence of, um, of uh, very good students who worked in that area, and did indeed um, complete their theses in that area, but... That was sort of finished by about 2008. I felt by that time we'd done enough in that area, so I basically uh, moved out, out of that. Um, my, um, oh yeah, one thing um, I um, should mention uh, about, about both my Sussex and my uh, Illinois studies was teaching. Um, at Sussex, I taught just about, I think, every course in, in the undergraduate syllabus with two exceptions. The first exception is not particularly surprising, it was elementary electronics. Um, so I've never been a good experimentalist, so that was not my, my cup of tea. Uh, the other one, however, is perhaps slightly more surprising. I never taught, either at Sussex or, in fact, later at Illinois, I never taught a straight course on uh, elementary quantum mechanics. Uh, I did teach one in Ghana when I was there in West Africa. That was the only time I've ever taught. I, I, I've taught lots of courses on the conceptual foundations of quantum mechanics or various advanced topics, but never an elementary one. Maybe I'm, I might even remember to do that next fall. I don't know. I don't know. I'm so done. Um, yeah, and then at, at Illinois, yeah, I, I mostly I taught um, graduate, uh, advanced graduate courses, but uh, in my mm, more or less my research area. But one one course which I particularly enjoyed teaching over the last, and I've now taught it, I don't know, five or six times probably, um, is a course called Space, Time and Matter. It, um, uh, basically, if people ask me to describe it, I say, well, basically we start with Aristotle and end up with Stephen Hawking. Um, it's basically uh, um, the basic, uh, concepts, basic concepts of physics, for, but for non-physicists. So we get people taking it from... Um, every department of the university, basically, from English, accounting, psychology, you name it. And um, uh, it's also hev very heavily, um, uh, the assessment is very heavily oriented towards um, extended written work, essays, not, not uh, calculations, so, and had to iterate those, feedback with the students. Uh, it's very hard work, but I found very, very satisfying to, uh, to teach, so I've been doing that for a long time. My current interests, uh, well, um, uh, are, are quite a few. I would like to understand the um, me mechanism of uh, high temperature superconductivity, certainly. I'd um, like to push the um, foundational work a bit further, though I, right now I think, we, as, as Dupanka mentioned, we um, uh, did do, uh, I say we because I, I was a co author, although it's not, I was really a sort of minor player. Uh, we, the NTT people, um, uh, Kathy Yanagi et al., uh, did this experiment, which the experiment basically which Anupam Gurg and I had proposed back in '85. Effectively, they, they did this experiment, and lo and behold, it came out according to quantum mechanics. So, no big surprises there, but um, at least we have pushed the um, explicit refutation of what I call macro realistic theories a lot further towards our conscious um, experience. And I would like to think of what, try, ways of trying to do that harder. Um, in addition to that, um, I've got, a, for many, many years, I've had an ongoing project on trying to understand the universal properties of glasses at low temperatures, and I'm collaborating with Project Shukla on, on, on that and other people. Um, still haven't really reached a definite conclusion. And even, the thing that's really been obsessing me most over the last um, five years or so has been the question of topological quantum computing, in particular in the so-called P plus IP Fermi superfluids, like in principle helium-3A, although it's probably not a good um, practical candidate, but perhaps strontium ruthenate, something like that. Uh, as some of you might know, there's been a lot of work on, uh, theoretical work on that in the last um, 10, 15 years or so, almost without exception, it's been based on the so-called Bogolyubov degen equations. Now, the Bogolyubov degen equations have served us very well in condensed matter physics for the last 60 years. Why should we doubt them? Well, the problem is that in condensed matter theory, in condensed matter physics, you're normally interested in the 
gross behavior of the sample averaged over a lot of, of individual quantum mechanical wave functions. By contrast, when you're doing quantum information, you're interested in the very delicate properties of individual um, wave functions. So it's not at all clear to me that the techniques which have been tried and true in, uh, in traditional condensed matter physics are going to work anymore in that uh, area. If I had more time, I could give you a whole hour's um, seminar on, on that, but I, I won't. Um, so, the, yeah, that's um, r roughly my current interests. What have, um, what have I l learned um, over this um, 60 years? Well, um, I think um, I've learned a few things. I've learned, first, of, first of all, it isn't always a good idea. If you're faced with a new problem, it's always a good idea to go and read up all the existing literature on it. As I remarked um, last night, had I actually... Uh, at the time when the new experiments on uh, NMR and helium-3 uh, came up from Cornell in the spring of 73, had I actually known the standard theory of NMR, I would almost certainly have gone off in the wrong direction, as a, as a lot of people did. So better to just um, say, forget it. I'm going to first try to figure it out myself, and then I'll go back and see if someone else has uh, figured it out too. Um, Again, I think it, I feel it's very useful to be able to formulate a really concrete question which you want to answer. When I go to, um, I'm afraid when I go to experimental talks these days in various areas of condensed matter physics, so often it seems to be something like this. We're going to investigate the relation between phenomenon A and phenomenon B. We're going to, um, we're going to try to, to figure out the... Um, the, the effect of, of, of point A on point B and so on and so forth. Not, no specific questions that you can answer. I, I've always felt it's very, very important to write down a specific question and say preferably a yes-no question, which uh, you think you're going to answer with this set of experiments. And I've always tried to interact with my experimental colleagues you know, with this in, in mind. Um, uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's certainly incredibly important to me to have a relaxed environment in which I could do my early work at least in Sussex could be done. And furthermore, again, I think it was, it's been invaluable to me that over the whole of my career, with the exception of the uh, post postdoc uh, career, with the exception of that one year in Japan, in which I took in, I didn't mention this, but in 73 to 4, um, uh, we, I had a sabbatical in, in Japan at the uh, University of Tokyo in this case. And, but apart from that year, I've uh, never uh, not been te teaching undergraduates or graduate students, and I, I really feel that's been immensely important uh, to me. Well, to um, get towards my um, conclusion now, um, well, I think I, I've been extremely lucky in my career. Not only if I had a very, for most of it, a very congenial environment, working environment, I've had a lot of very, very good um, international uh, students, in particular international students, almost all my students, that, with a few exceptions, that does annoy have been international. I've been able to visit um, a large um, number of uh, places, both places where physics has, um, uh, is, is going very strong, like um, China, Japan, and of course India, um, and um, uh, but also some places where it perhaps isn't quite, a, one doesn't think of it as quite so strong, like uh, Malaysia, Iran, um, and, um, perhaps uh, also most of all Ghana, where really, they're really struggling quite hard to, uh, uh, to get it in some sense off the ground. And all of those, I think, have been um, valuable to me. And I, I do particularly value my um, interaction with Indian um, physics, um, thanks, uh, thanks in part to uh, Dipankar and others, I've been able to make, although I haven't spent so, so much time continuously as I have in Japan or China, I have made well, probably a dozen or 15 visits, I would think, over the last uh, 40 years to India and always enjoyed them and enjoyed my interactions. Um, the uh, one thing, however, I would like to finish with, although it's not in fact directly related to my own, well, it is in some sense related to my own career. Um, when I look around today at the uh, uh, physics scene, or more generally, I should say, the scientific scene, I really feel rather worried about the ethos in which young people going into physics have to operate. 
When I finished my PhD, DPhil, and for, uh, in Oxford, and applied for a postdoc position at the University of Illinois in the fall, uh, in summer of '64, um, the University of Illinois was, in my field, was just undoubtedly the world's leading institution. Um, I was applying for it. What, what were my credentials? I had my, my the uh, thesis, which was still being finished. As to my publications, there was one which was actually not published, but uh, eventually got published. That was a one-page physics letter. That was the sum total of my publications. Nowadays, as I go around listening to, um, uh, to, to uh, people at the postgraduate uh, stage, uh, I, I hear them talking to one another, and it's quite clear that even in the US, and even more so, I'm afraid, in China, um, they feel that they really have to have two or three papers not uh, published, not, not just pa published papers, but papers published in so-called high-impact journals, Science, Nature, um, Proceedings of the National Academy, and so forth, before it even makes sense to start applying for a postdoc position at a reputable institution. And this goes on and on when, when they're finishing their postdoc and trying to apply for faculty positions. Same. How many publications do you have in science, nature, whatever? Um, I think it's terrible. Um, what this means is that unless you've, you're very, very, um, very determined, what you're going to do is to spend most of your time working on precisely those problems which you think you have a reasonable chance and perhaps an excellent chance of finishing within the time scale, you know, two, two or, or, or three years. Almost by definition, those are not the really interesting problems. Right? Um, I'm just um, eternally thankful that I didn't have to worry about that when I was at the University of Sussex and doing work on helium-3. Of course, in some sense, um, you could say this is... This state of affairs is the consequence of a good thing. The good thing is that in 2019, the whole area of academic physics is far more open, far more open access to it than there was in 1964. Um, uh, that applies both um, externally, um, say, we get lots and lots of applicants now from um, China, which we've certainly not had in 1964. Um, and uh, from all over the world, in fact. And that means there's huge pressure on a limited number of jobs. Somehow we've got, I think we've got to find a way of coping with that situation without um, doing this awful bean counting, as it were. How do we do it? I don't know. But I think one thing, we, one question we could ask ourselves is the following. Should it be, in some sense, a, um, understood, uh, either formally or informally, to be a requirement that when you get to a certain point in your career, um, so let's say by the time in the US when you become a full professor, Thereafter, you are actually expected to spend a certain fraction of your time, I don't know, 20%, 25%, I don't know, but explicitly on the evaluation of younger people. That means if we all were to do that, then I think we probably could actually read some of the um, papers that our applicants have written and not just count how many were in um, PNAS and how many, on how many of their first author and, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I really actually think that that's, uh, that's very, very important. But anyway, um, uh, well, as I said, I've um, uh, enjoyed very much uh, throughout the years my contact with um, Indian physicists, and I am um, very grateful uh, to you for having organized this, and thank you all very much for taking part in this event. Interesting program, research program, collaborating with quantum optics yes. and also psychophysics, biology people oh, are, yes. right, are designing novel experiments on, uh, related to quantum measurement yes, problem. Yes, yes. So can you say uh, sure. a few words about sure, it? Sure, That's absolutely. It. Yes, um, well, um, we now know, um, uh, following the experiments of the last um, few years, that at the level of superconducting devices, um, which involve maybe, well, it depends how you count, there's always a problem about how you count, but we can say roughly involving some, something like a billion electrons doing one thing or the other thing, is that quantum mechanics does appear to be still working rather well. Um, but we still have, at least I still have, a, a difficulty with Schrodinger's cat. And um, more generally, with the, uh, the, qu the uh, question, does quantum mechanics still work at the level of everyday life? 
So how might one tr tr uh, try to approach this, uh, uh, this question experimentally? Well, um, one of the things that I thought might be, uh, at least in principle, a possibility, and I'm not the only one to have suggested this by any means, um, was that um, we might try to, to ask, does the human visual system work um, in, in the context of quantum mechanics like an inanimate measuring device? So the idea would be, crudely speaking, that you take a beam, very weak beam of single photons, fire it at the subject's, uh, say, right eye, and get him or her to declare um, when they thought they saw something. Do the same for the left eye. And then you would prepare, a, again, a very weak beam of photons, but now in a superposition, a quantum superposition of the two states. Um, and uh, 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 fire it towards the subject and ask them to declare what they saw. And the, the question, we seem at first sort of a rather trivial one, is, well, would their, um, would their account of the, of the statistics be consistent with the standard, um, uh, standard Born's rule um, uh, uh, result for an inanimate measuring device, or is there something more complicated going on? You might know people like uh, Giancarlo Girardi and uh, some of his, uh, uh, of his uh, affiliates have, ha have actually tried to work out specific models of what might happen in that kind of context. I, uh, I actually um, w was involved in getting my um, uh, sort of matchmaker. Um, I got my um, experimental quantum optics colleague, Paul Quiert, together with a colleague in the psychology department um, uh, Wong Sell, Francis Wong. Um, uh, uh, she's a, a uh, world leading expert in psychophysics, and they designed an experiment to essentially uh, test this idea. Alas, and it, they had a very good uh, graduate student, Rebecca Holmes, who um, whom they, they uh, signed up to work on this. Um, unfortunately, it turns out the human eye is really a very inefficient detector. Um, and uh, uh, that she eventually figured out that in order to do the experiment in a meaningful way would take, uh, well, pr practically the rest of her lifetime, certainly much more than her lifetime as a graduate student. So, um, so it didn't go forward with that. But I have to say that that experiment was nice in the sense that it produced a lot of spin-off on the basic psychophysics. There's always been this question of how efficient is the human eye in detecting... Um, uh, detecting single photons or two or three. I think everyone agrees it can detect bunches of about six or so, but below that it's very uncertain. And Rebecca was actually able to make quite, quite considerable contribution to that. But, but as I say, the original idea, unfortunately, d didn't turn out to be practically very, very feasible. I should say, incidentally, the only reason I was able to become matchmaker for this process was that um, uh, Francis, um, uh, the uh, psycho psychophysicist, had actually attended some of my 519 lectures, the, the le lecture, sorry, the lectures on space, time, and matter that I mentioned. And that was how I got to know her and got to uh, introduce her to, to Paul Quirin. Maybe we will stop it at that. Bhaskaran uh, can continue over lunch. Your question, discussion can be over lunch. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>